So, good morning, everybody. It's 12 o'clock, so we are about to start the last technical session of this PCC conference. Please get in, take a seat. I hope we get a bit more audience. Where are the other 300 or 250? <laughs> But at least um, all presentations here in this room are being recorded, so we have the option to put that on the website, if you all agree. Yeah, okay, fine. Good. So let me first briefly introduce myself. I'm Wolfram Belzo. I'm just retired from my university. You see it there. University Kaiserslautern in Germany, and I spent uh, some 20 years uh, also in industry, partly uh, responsible for control center technologies and a control center manufacturer. So we want to talk about highly automated system operation. And, um, oh yeah, that works. And uh, the motivation for that is then if you have a look on what we are doing in operation, then we find that only a small part of what we are doing is really closed loop automated in a strict sense. This is basically the protection, of course. This is partly voltage controlled, it's frequency controlled, it's load shedding and all this stuff where the operator is really off the loop. But most of that is very conventional. So we're collecting data from our system, we process it, we test it, we check it, we are doing state estimation, then we're putting that on the screen of the operator and say, please do. Of course, we're adding some optimization functions, we're adding, we're we'll starting to add decision support tools. This is a very interesting thing also for the PSCC community. But basically, we keep the operator responsible and in the loop. And the question is, of course, is that sustainable? Can we do that? Having in mind that our systems are changing, that we are getting much more complicated systems, that we need to take care of the interface between the TSO and the DSO level, and that we get millions of small generators sitting in the lower voltage levels, which we need somehow to control, of course, um, as soon as the big generators may be no longer available for us. So, um, oh, sorry, I have to click here. What you want to do here in this panel is to first clarify the state of the art, of course, then maybe define needs and development targets and clarify obstacles and practical feasibility. I'm st still wondering, because we're all talking about autonomous car driving, and the first cars are on the roads, which are at least at limited speed, fully automatic. And this is a much more complex um, control problem compared to what we have, because basically we have to keep the frequency inside tolerances, we keep the line loadings below maximum and keep the voltages in tolerance. It's rather simple principle. So what are the obstacles for getting more automation? So we want to in identify hopefully the work in progress and some required R&D or ongoing R&D act activities and clarify how to bridge the gap between what we are doing here in the PSSC community and what has been done in practice in real operation and maybe help to identify an implementation roadmap. So before we get into that, I just want to briefly introduce the speakers here on the panel. I did that also already for myself. So I start from the left and also in the sequence of the small presentations we will have uh, right after that. Christian Raytons, very well known in the community uh, as full professor and head of the Institute of Energy and Systems, Energy Efficiency and Energy Economics at TU Dortmund University in Germany. And he was up many years with ABB, head of the research center. So the right person here. 
Then it's my pleasure to, as a second speaker then, to introduce Dr. Renuka Chatterjee, also very well known in the community from her CIGRE study committee C2 activities. She's uh, Vice President Operations and uh, at Midcontinent Independent System Operator, better known as MISO uh, in the US, and she leads all aspects of system operations, operational planning and market operations. Then we have Lucas Salucian from RTE, or former EDF. He spent some 20 years in R&D uh, with both companies and um, is now leading a cross-cutting R&D program on digital solutions with RTE. Then it's my pleasure to introduce Suri Parara, Pereira. I hope I pronounced that correctly more or less. Sorry for that. He is deputy manager for medium voltage and low voltage dispatch at Eredis. So the Eredis is the uh, Portuguese uh, DSO. And he is in the unit responsible for medium voltage operations. And finally, I have Stefan Dalhus here as an industry representative. Uh, he is with PSI Software AG in Germany. So one of these uh, prominent uh, CS control center makers and he leads uh, research projects in the contents of curative congestion management, AI-driven anomaly detection, and other decision support functionalities. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for spending the time and doing all the preparations we have done in advance of this event. And with that, I want to start right in time with the first presentation. I want to ask Christian to give his introduction. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Wolfram. So now I need the next set of slides, please. It's coming. This is. Oh, ah, that works. Now the. There it's it's coming. Okay, so. Yeah, what I would like to talk about uh, is uh, we did a study from the German Association of Electrical Engineers and we said, okay, what is it with autonomy? Everybody is talking about autonomous driving. What does it mean for, for power systems, for power system control and operation? And so here you see the number of people uh, who have been members of this task force like Wolfram and me. Martin Braun, who wanted to be here on this panel, but he got yeah, Corona, so I'm replacing him. And when we are talking about, let's see, uh, okay. So really this analogy uh, to, to look on the one hand side, autonomous driving, backward, forward, braking, speeding up and so on. And in the first glance we said, it's more or less similar complex or not even more complex to run a power system. But the difference is in power systems, usually the, the, the real actions have to take place if there is a problem, if there is a fault, a contingency, a severe disturbance. And on the other side, it would be like if there is a problem in the car, the car would go to the workshop and re re repair itself, which is usually not doing. So in the car sector, they try to do the normal operation, but on the power system side, we have to really deal with other exceptional cases. So it's not too easy, it's so easy to say it's, it's a one-to-one -one relation. So, and what is the target with all this highly automation or autonomous uh, operation? One is definitively we talk about security of supply, resiliency, self-healing grids, things like that. Then really the increased uh, grid capacity or we need an increased grid capacity by, by all the uh, renewables, new loads and so on. So to use the grid more extensively, then cost reduction, efficiency increase, the question in the control center, do we have all the people to deal with a, with a higher complexity? Because uh, it's not a question of getting rid of people in the control center, but they have to deal with a higher uh, complexity and they need to be able to handle it. So, and then as well, there are a number of new regulatory requirements and so on, which as well require a high degree of automation. So these are really the targets. Yeah, and then when we look into it, uh, 
on the on the top on the left side it's more or less a conventional system so a human is giving control commands to the control system and then it's interacting with the grid and gives the feedback so that's more or less what is going on today the next level is on the bottom left side there are some assistance system giving some advice to the human and the human is then taking the decisions and activates what's going on and then on the top uh, right side there is really the human set some parameters but then the system is more or less automatically doing something and the, the human is only supervising it and that's more or less what the next level is on extra high voltage and high voltage level and then really on the bottom right side the human is out of the loop so really putting parameters and then the rest of the system is really running. So you just put the targets and then everything is fully automated running. So these are more or less the levels. And then we really, in the document, we were analyzing it more in detail. So we said, what are these different, different levels of autonomy? Really like in the, uh, in the vehicle uh, sector, we said, okay, there is either no automation or there, is a, there are the assistance functions. I don't go into all these details because it goes in observability, controllability, awareness, decision support. These are then the details where we, where we checked which kind of functions are nowadays available, which are in the pipeline of research. What do we expect in the next years to come to really increase this level of, of autonomy? The next levels are then really partial function automation, uh, which is split into autonomy level two and three. So there are really some background functions and so on. And the next level is then really the whole system automation, autonomy level four, high automation. And the last level is really this full autonomous operation and automation. So, and that is really when we see it when we look into the functions i have now some some overview slides like this so here you see all the different functions operational planning the operation in green is more or less a control center related processes like business processes market processes system and grid planning and so on and when we look into it then the question is where do we have really uh, some people involved and which kind of functions do have the potential to be highly automated. And that's what we see here. So more or less all the functions have the potential. They are in the pipeline, a lot of things which could be uh, automated. On distribution level, nowadays we have more or less no functions or few functions and so on and people are involved. Uh, but then the next level is as well, in the future, there will be more and more functions coming up with a high potential for being automated. So therefore, I think we have a strong trend here and we have a lot of things to do. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, maybe I forgot to mention that we first want to have all these short presentations, then get into discussions both here on the on the on the platform but also of course with you at the audience so next speaker is oh you have your mic already yes, Renuka, please do. go ahead i do could i have the clicker please for the slides all right while the clicker gets to me uh good afternoon everyone um today i wanted to share miso's work towards uh the changing grid and also specifically highlight our vision towards how we achieve the automation towards the uh, future grid. Um, so with that, let's go to the first slide. Um, reliability imperative is the, uh, MISO's work or framework that uh, is responding to decentralization, decarbonization, and digitalization trends we are seeing in the energy industry. Uh, for today's purpose, I'll focus on uh, two of the four initiatives in our reliability imperative. Uh, we chose the word imperative because there is some sense of urgency because the changes in the grid are accelerating faster than we had anticipated. Uh, operations of the future is our vision to uh, drive a different balance of um, automation between our people, process, and technology. 
uh, that's going to pretty much, uh, as suggested by um, uh, the speaker before me, on automated car. Um, and then market redefinition, when we have new resources, new behaviors, um, and new uses of electricity, we need uh, new markets to address the same. So I'll skip a slide. Um, so this is our market redefinition slide. Um, it, as, um, as we respond to decarbonization, digitalization, and decentralization, the mo three most important attributes we are seeking are availability, flexibility, and visibility. Um, as first, you know, we all want to have electricity available, right? So we'll miss our Wi-Fi before we miss our light bulb. But um, similarly, we need flexibility as wind ramps down or as solar ramps down or ramps up in the morning, we want to make sure we have appropriate flexibility in the resource fleet that we operate. Uh, visibility with microgrids and distributed energy resources that are um, um, coming into the uh, grid, we need to decide what we want to see and how we want to operate the same. Again, not to say there is just challenges, but there's a lot of opportunity uh, in enabling these new resource capabilities. I will not cover all of the details on this slide, but I wanted to provide it uh, for review after. So this is our slide. Um, you know, uh, the speaker before me used the car. I'm going to use a different analogy. Um, to bring our people, our vendors, our uh, technology, everything together, we inspired our team through a vision called Electra. Um, so everyone is familiar with Amazon's Alexa. Um, on your phones, there is Siri, and then Google has Hey Google. Um, and all of these tools le represent a level of automation uh, that brings together in all of the systems um, to give information at your fingertips. Um, for example, your phone tells you in the morning it's going to take you 12 minutes to your uh, office if you live close by. Um, so I want to show a brief video here on what we mean by operations of the future. May we have the video, please? Maybe. <laughs> We'll just give it one more second. If it doesn't, we'll try something else. Technology is rapidly changing the way electricity is produced, distributed, and consumed. Grid operators like MISO now have better access to tools and processes to ensure efficient reliability. For example, machine learning techniques combined with high-speed computing can provide useful insights into the dispatch of generation, identification of load patterns, and mitigation of transmission congestion. On a typical day, a control room operator will have instant access to essential data, leading to proactive decision-making in real time. Electra, give me a status update. Conditions in the MISO footprint are stable. The current load is 92,417 megawatts. The projected peak load for today is 112,449 megawatts, occurring at hour 17. There are no active system alerts, warnings, or events. Electra, what does South's efficiency look like? Currently, there is a 6% capacity margin with a load of 29,102 megawatts. There are 2,000 megawatts of imports, and the regional dispatch transfer is 1,800 megawatts flowing north to south with 800 megawatts stranded. Electra, what's causing these stranded megawatts? The stranded megawatts are a result of the Grimes to Mount Sion 138 kilovolt line for the loss of Grimes to Ponderosa 230 kilovolt line, driven by the Perky to Diana 345 kilovolt line forced outage in Southwest Power Pool. Electra, run a study and provide alternative options. Here are three options to improve capacity. Electra, select option OA2. To confirm, you would like to send a start notification to the Sabine Unit 4 generator, is that correct? Yes. A start has been issued for the Sabine Unit 4 generator. In the future, MISO's ability to deliver exceptional value hinges on our ability to anticipate and enable a shift toward a more digital future. Harnessing the power of innovative technologies could allow operators to work proactively rather than reactively to help keep the lights on.
right? So that represents our voice assistant approach to automation for our control room. Because as I heard um, over the con last course of last three days, I heard a lot of papers that were talking about applying advanced algorithms, uh, software techniques, data strategy techniques, and uh, cybersecurity techniques to how to provide tools securely to for the operations ultimately to make sure uh, we deliver safe and reliable electricity. As all, as all that comes together, we want to be able to make sure all those tools are usable. So having a uh, vision like Electra or a voice assistant for the operations allows us to think about what kind of automation, how do we integrate these systems? Uh, for example, we ourselves have multiple vendors and not all these systems talk to each other. How do you integrate all those systems together? Um, so this is our operations of the future roadmap. It has multiple work streams and each of these represents an initiative that is progressing towards um, that operations of the future. Probably the one that I'll cover here is manual planning scenarios. Um, today, our operations planning team looks at what's gonna happen next month, what's gonna happen one week ahead, and they kind of help us uh, think about what actions we need to take. Uh, we are improving forecasting in that front. We are talking about what metrics we wanna apply in the future. Ultimately, we wanna get to reliability, automation, and then predictive planning scenarios, just like in the video. Uh, the operations team can ask, okay, what, what, sh what scenario should we consider? Um, as we have this vision, we are also realistic uh, in the sense that we have to keep investing in our people and technology. Um, COVID hasn't been great from that perspective. The turbulence from great resignation, I also like to call it the great opportunity for young professionals to switch jobs and work remotely has uh, kind of shaken up the... Uh, um, talent retention uh, in our organization for sure. I'm sure the entire world is facing the same. Um, so we are working on how to retain and manage our talent um, to get to this future vision. Um, I will suggest since uh, there's a lot of academicians here that we need to encourage uh, more students to pursue cross majors between math and electrical engineering. Um, so I'll leave uh, you all on that note. Okay, thank you very much, Renuke. Thank you. Also for the nice video. I think we will get back to that in the discussions then. Okay, okay. so hello let's everyone. Be, uh, Lucas, please. Okay, thank you. Hello. So my first slide. Okay, I would have uh, <laughs> liked to, to, to present RT, but uh, my uh, colleagues, uh, Florent Xavier, already did this uh, yesterday on the, in, the, in, in, in the dinner. So Perhaps I, I can ask you some question to, to, to check if uh, everything is clear. So RT is the French uh, transmission system operator. So we operate the system, obviously, but uh, we also maintain and develop a new infrastructure as we, we, we own the assets. Um, so one slide to, to, to remind uh, what are the, the, the transformation the, the system is undergoing. So. Everybody is aware of that, but it helps me to, 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 to introduce the next slide. So uh, the major, uh, it's the, the, the main uh, thing is that uh, we have massive in, uh, it's energy transition with massive uh, uh, introduction of uh, renewable in the system. So this brings a lot of uncertainties and uh, this production is often on the distribution grid. And uh, also it's uh, less predictable, less observable, and less controllable. So uh, apart from the certainties, it's also the whole uh, physics of the system that is changing. And we are moving from a physics of rotating machine to power electronics uh, interface. So this means uh, uh, less inertia and faster dynamics. So this is the case for generation to be connected through uh, power electronics, but it's also uh, the case for consumption, and uh, we will have to, to manage thousands and thousands of, uh, of, uh, of uh, agents with uh, relative autonomy. So, uh, and to end, uh, last but not least, uh, there are uh, uh, people, citizens, uh, would like to, to have their word uh, to say on the energy policy, so this is good for uh, for for democracy, but uh, it's not so good for for for, uh, <laughs> for us for TSO because we have many difficulties to to know insert new uh, new structures in the in the in the grid. So 
this means uh, the complexity is increasing, obviously, and uh, the TSOs and the DSO uh, uh, have to, to, to manage this in the future. So we were speaking in this session about uh, automatization of the system operation, and we think that uh, uh, this goes uh, hand in hand with uh, uh, fundamental uh, uh, question, which is uh, what will be the, the, the architecture of control of the system in the future. And so basically today uh, we have two layers of control, one uh, at the substation level with a very simple uh, 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 protection scheme and uh, we uh, optimize at the control room le level, we, we have optimization and we operate the system. And so we, we gather uh, information from the, from the ground, from the substation and we uh, carry out some simulation uh, in the control room and then we send back uh, some controls uh, to, to, to the ground and to the substation. So we think that uh, for the future to, to, to face this increasing complexity, we need to, uh, uh, to insert uh, uh, in the system a new uh, control layer uh, which is intermediate uh, uh, in between uh, the protection layer uh, at uh, the, the, the substation level and the optimized layer uh, in the in the control room so this layer is a control layer and we think that it should be much more decentralized much more uh, at the edge of the system and we want to to push in that uh, in that layer uh, new uh, uh, automatic control and those control uh, uh, will be in charge of a local area of some substation and they uh, they will uh, operate uh, on this substation in a reflexive manner okay so for example uh, if we have some congestion issues uh, on, on a local area of some substation um, the automaton or the, the, the automatic control in charge of this area uh, will gather the information coming from this area and only from this area uh, the voltage the current uh, the topology uh, the, 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 the generation and he will try to relieve the constraint, playing only with the levels of flexibility available in this area, meaning that he can play with uh, some uh, uh, curtailment of generation, wind generation, for example, uh, with the topology, with the battery, with smart wire. But the only uh, data and levels of flexibility concerned by the automaton in this, uh, in this uh, layer uh, are uh, uh, coming just from this area, the, the, the concern area of the, some substation. So, uh, obviously, uh, so we also think that uh, those automaton, um, the good option is to have some control loop uh, optimization uh, control uh, because uh, it's something uh, very easy to tackle in certainties and we, we can push some simplified model uh, on the, uh, in those control. Those, it's, we, 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 we think that we should uh, foster the deployment of this new uh, layer with uh, many automatons and control loop optimization control in this layer. So obviously we have the two other layers that are connected. So the optimized layer would play a role uh, much more in anticipation than in reaction. Okay, we will uh, devolve uh, the, the, the reaction to the new control layer. And... Uh, in this optimized layer, uh, we will also um, uh, foster uh, new methodologies to help the operators um, based, for example, on machine learning techniques. So we will provide, for example, the operator uh, to focus on only uh, the risky situation in the whole distribution of uncertainties. We will provide some uh, um, proxies uh, to to speed up the, the, the calculation. So we provide some proxies of detailed simulation using machine learning techniques. We can also uh, provide new strategy and help the operators to to, to get a, a much better strategy to 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 op to, to, to operate the the, the, the grid. So um, uh, okay, okay, just one slide, please. <laughs> and I finish. Okay, so the three uh, layers are uh, complementary, and uh, so optimized layer and control layer. So I mean, I said that uh, the, the 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 control layer was much more decentralized and much more at the, at the edge. So 
it's also for ICT uh, purpose. So I, I want the data to come from uh, the, 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 this layer and to, uh, I don't want the data to, to, to go to the, to the upper layer and then uh, go, uh, get back to the, to the control layer. So decentralization, but uh, in the optimized layer, uh, the, the optimized layer should uh, know and, and take into account the different uh, control, the automatic control that we have in the control layer. So it has to take this into account. So we need to provide some proxy of this uh, automatic control to the optimized layer to be taken into account in the uh, different uh, simulation tools. And uh, perhaps I can end here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucas. So now we're going down from TSO to DSO level. Rui, please. Hello, good morning, everyone. So as you know, Ehedge is the major DSO in Portugal. It's been so for quite some time, although with different names. And um, the network was different a few years ago. We had low levels of observability and controllability levels within the lower voltage levels, as well as very few automation functions and primarily installed in primary substations. Although, after some investment, some development, today, those levels rose. And with them, came some new sets of automation functions. And that allowed us to improve the quality of service by a major amount. The TIEPI in the medium voltage has dropped close to 90% over the last 20 years. Now, this evolution was lived under a scenario where we have centralized production, transmission, distribution, a one-way power flow. And that is no longer true. Today, we are living a paradigm shift. We have new players coming to the, the sector. We have distributed generation, we have electrical vehicles, prosumers, storage. The di distributed energy resources may yet to prove to be the single most disruptive influence in the electric grid and to the utilities business models. Now, this will be the future scenario and perhaps some of the places, the present scenario. Now, in the meantime, to tackle these challenges, some advanced tools and automation have appeared. They are, they are constantly being optimized, being developed, as we needed them to be, to give answers to these new challenges. And therefore, HEDS is committed to this path. We recently are in the process of the EDMS upgrading, and we have recently deployed two self-healing pilot projects. These pilot projects, we have one dedicated to the underground network with uh, five feeders, 13 switching stations, and one dedicated to overhead, overhead networks with one, one feeder and three remote uh, reclosers and three switching stations. Now, each project has its own controller and it is fully integrated within our control centers. Now, we have the, the project, all features of the project went live early this year. We are now six months running. And uh, although some minor issues have been identified, some algorithms might be optimized, the, the system is performed as expected and as it was designed to be. Now, what else do we need to keep us to fulfilling our objectives as DSOs and our roles as a facilitator of the energy transition? We need to keep rising these automation and observability and controllability levels so that our advanced functions can work accurately and our operation can work in a sturdy, quick and reliable manner. We are facilitating the shift of the role from the human operator to a human supervisor, a human manager. And also, we have to keep developing themes like data management, forecasting, markets and flexibility, interoperability, automation functions, and also smart charging. Now, to close. Um, on my personal opinion, the sector is becoming so complex that in a scenario where we have a human operator assisted by automation, is becoming a scenario where we have a human, not a human operator, but a human supervisor, a human manager, overseeing a much more autonomous system that operates most of the network on its own. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Rui. So now, finally, 
We are switching to the control center manufacturers, and so let's see what they can deliver. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, hello, everybody. Um, yeah, so we have learned a lot about um, yeah, what are the requirements of the industry. Um, we have heard different levels of autonomy um, for the um, autonomous functionality um, that are going to be developed. But um, our main concern here is how do we get there? How do we develop methodologies or modules that enable the um, control system operator um, yeah, to have uh, uh, some uh, degree of autonomy during the operation. And um, yeah, uh, clearly we are um, doing a lot of um, research in this direction. And in the R&D department, um, yeah, we, are, we have created a vision and a mission for us um, yeah, to, to define for us how do we get from idea to a final product. And um, yeah, the vision is um, we need to bridge the gap between future problems and current solutions. So uh, our problem here, or um, not really a problem, but um, the thing is that uh, we don't start at a, a green field. We have uh, systems currently running um, and we have aspects that we need to take into account when we um, develop further functionalities. So um, there needs to be a transition between what we are doing now uh, in the control systems via what we are doing in the next five years or 10 years in the control systems. Um, there won't be a um, shutdown and restart of uh, some kind of uh, new software version. It's uh, always a continuous um, development process. And um, yeah, this is what we are dealing with. And uh, the mission kind of describes how we are getting there. Um, so our mission is enabling a climate neutral energy system by applying cutting edge technologies, skills and processes, converging in marketable minimum viable products. So what do I mean by this? Um, so first of all, we need um, like skills and processes for developing these functionalities. Um, yeah, the skills are developed here in, in the research uh, community. Um, yeah, the conference here has shown that we have heard a lot about um, yeah, new methodologies, optimization stuff. Um, there's a lot of ideas and, um, and skill and knowledge uh, developed here uh, that someone needs to find the way into the industry and yeah, into the software that uh, runs the control centers. And this is uh, one point where we need to attack and we need to have processes on how to yeah, implement these ideas into our new projects, uh, products. And um, the way we are, we are doing this also via research projects is uh, we are creating um, marketable minimum viable products. So we are um, in contrast not, um, not developing prototypes. So a prototype would be, um, I don't know, maybe a simulation where you prove, okay, this concept works. Then you write a paper, present it here, uh, for example, and then, um, yeah, the prototype has uh, fulfilled its need and can be, be scrapped. And a minimum viable product is really a deployable solution that you can integrate into a control center and fulfills the minimum needs um, of a customer, for example. Of course, when you would um, make a product that is really, um, yeah, run, run into production, there is a lot more to it than just what you could create in a research project. But minimum viable products are a starting point for this. And when we create these um, minimum viable products, we can see on the right side, there is some kind of um, circle, uh, how we create these. So um, we have an architecture where we can integrate this uh, MVPs into our products and um, yeah, um, they can start living there as a um, yeah, pilot project or, um, or field test, um, which does not really affect the um, uh, production systems, but you can test the functionalities. Then we have an R&D um, ecosystem um, where we work together with researchers, universities, and other companies. And um, there we develop R&D pilots with lead customers that are that have specific problems or ideas um, that they want to um, to to find solutions for. And then we go into the industrial ecosystem development where we have maybe uh, other um, partners from the industry um, to, you know, share um, common uh, codes or um, yeah, standards um, where we implement our solutions. And then we go into the externalization, talk about our um, uh, yeah, new developments and new products and hopefully find new customers where we can um, finalize uh, our MVPs and um, start integrating them into the market. Um, so this is just um, 
a little bit of contribution on how to bridge the gap and how, how to get there. Um, so this is uh, how we try to do it. And um, what kind of aspects are we um, performing our research on? Um, we have like network analysis and automation. Um, so this is uh, more or less um, about gaining knowledge what is actually happening in our systems. So there's a lot of uh, research um, regarding um, flexibilities, um, medium voltage and low voltage state estimation. Um, there's also thermal system operation where you um, try to have not um, fixed um, like thermal limits on your um, overhead lines, for example, but you can um, yeah, increase the load over a certain time if the weather condition, for example, allow it. And this helps um, a lot in um, system operation strategies and higher utilization of, um, um, of available capaci capaci capacity of transmission systems. Um, of course, we are also um, looking at decision support functionalities. Um, one major trend here is, at least in Germany, is the creative congestion management, where we are also operating uh, one of our MVPs uh, currently in a pilot system. Um, here we are at uh, level one, so to say, of the automation um, of the autonomous levels, um, where we determine um, yeah, creative congestion measures and inform the um, uh, operators what we are doing there and they can just take a look there and um, yeah determine if they if they if there's uh, some action needed but the system itself is um, run only preventively um, yeah, and then we have adaptive protective uh, protection systems where um, yeah, the parameters of protection systems are updated during the operation depending on which um, uh, topology configuration there is in the system um, and we have congestion management and distribution grids. Um, and of course, uh, when you look at the um, functionalities there, a lot of um, IT um, and communication devices um, need to be integrated and um, yeah, the system is getting more and more complex. So um, we also need, um, need to act on that. So cyber security is a big, um, big topic here. Um, we are focusing our, our, our work on the anomaly detection um, and intrusion detection, um, yeah. Both are, um, okay, I'm running out of time. Okay, one last uh, mention, ITOT convergence. Uh, so this is like um, a new software um, architecture that we are trying to implement there. So um, multi-cloud deployment where you can easily integrate new functions in the control system. Um, we have microservice architectures, um, serverless event streaming software architectures. And um, yeah, there's a big playing field there currently where we try to um, yeah, update the system architecture. Okay, and that's it from my side. Thank you. Yo, thank you very much. Um, I just want to start the first discussion round here on the platform, then of course open that uh, to you in the audience. Um, to start with, um, maybe the first question to both uh, Christian and Stefan. What do you think, um, where will we have the most progress? More on the transmission system level or more on the distribution dis uh, system level related to automation? The reason why I'm asking is that many of these projects, decision support is, is, is uh, transmission, of course, because this is more complex. But if you're getting more and more needs to automate also in the low voltage we cannot afford to put an operator to each and every low voltage system so what is your expectation and what is the timeline for that what do you believe i think you already gave the answer i think it really on the on the lower level medium voltage for example self-healing grids on medium voltage coordination with low voltage supervision of voltage on the low voltage level, tappable transformers, which automatically will do something, uh, curtailment of, of charging of electric vehicles, all these things which can, let's say, quite easily implemented. It's difficult enough, but there are various uh, pilot projects and so on showing on the one inside the demand because there we have to invest billions of euro or whatever into distribution grids if we are not doing this automation. And therefore, I think that is really something which is will will at first really happen quite fast. I don't know. What is your opinion? Yeah, as I know that PSI is... Uh working across all voltage levels from distribution up to transmission so 
What is your manufacturer perspective? Uh, yes, I, I can agree with, with Christian that um, the, the low voltage levels are really um, have a great big need for automation because um, yeah, it's uh, just uh, big. And um, but on the other hand, um, the TSOs and DSOs, the the operation in the control center, the the work that the operators are doing there is getting more and more complex. And um, yeah, the the um, operators just the stress level of the operator are just really high because there's so much going on when there's like um, you know changes in uh, wind power or, or PV power and um, they need support there in order to 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 focus on what are the tasks um, that need to be done right now um, because when you have uh, stress in the system you have stress in the operator and um, yeah there is also a big driver for um, innovation and um, yeah maybe this is also something that we will see in the next years higher degree of automation just to um, relieve the stress level of the operators and uh, if I can again ask for the timeline if I think of a low voltage grid for example and the task would be from the control room of the higher voltage level please care for your voltage level and please reduce your power p and q to whatever numbers when will we have that available and running what do you believe <laughs> yeah i think it's um it, it depends how how strong the, the problems are so uh, when um it's it's uh, in, in my opinion it's always problem driven somehow so um yeah and yeah maybe it's it's uh, like when we can convince the people that functionality is needed because ah we don't have this problem but for example um like there's one system operator in northern germany um they have a lot of um installed wind capacity i think it's six times um, the installed wind capacity compared to the peak load and right now they have the problem that they cannot um yeah, integrate this this power uh, and feed it back to the um, transmission level and they are um yeah, having having um, great problems and uh, their solution is to divide their um their grid into like separate islands that are connected to the transmission level so that the um um uh, short circuit power is is low enough and um, but that means that they have to redesign their protection systems and depending on what kind of configuration they have um uh, they need to adapt the protection system and this is um something that uh, not really uh, another DSO is, is um, really interested in, but they have right now this problem and they want right now a solution and they have really high stress there. And I think in, in a few years, like when you look at the um, ideas of the government of Germany, how much wind energy and PV plants are going to be installed, like in five years, every DSO will have this problem and you will roll out this um, solution probably quite soon. I don't. I don't really can pin down a number, but I think, um, yeah, during due to the the um, probably fast change in in uh, how the system will be operated and what kind of renewable energies are um, are used, we will see maybe in the next five years some very big changes there. Okay, uh, maybe I can hand off over the same question to to Rui because uh, I was wondering about your last slide where you indicated that. You expect that the automation level in terms of controllability and observability is uh, will still be the lowest in the low voltage grid. Is that just a short term perspective or is that a long term perspective? No, that, that's that's today's per perspective. We have very low levels, although not quite like some a few years ago. But our expectations is to rise them in the highest percentages and at pair with the okay. other voltage levels because that's where most of the automation and controllability will be needed. Mm -hmm. So we can address all these DERs problems, massive uh, distributed generation all over. We, have, we need to have that kind of observability and controllability so we can have a full picture on how the flow is going mm -hmm. so we can operate the network and address problems accordingly. That's what we need. Okay. And maybe um, you have... Um reported about your pilot projects. So are there any lessons learned already about it? Yeah, sure. Um, the self-healing pilot projects, uh, I can disclose some information about that. Um, first, we wanted a system with a high level of automation. We didn't mm -hmm. want a system that just suggested the course of action to the operator. Mm -hmm. We actually wanted a system that performed switching actions. So 
a lot of work had to be put into algorithms, a lot of work and a lot of thought had to be put into interlockings, logic conditioning, mm -hmm. and the system had to perform in real time. Mm -hmm. So we had the, those, um, I'd say, dedicated controllers, and um, the system performed quite well. Okay. Um, one, um, one thing we have to thought about was the fallback plan in case we have to shut down the self-link system mm -hmm. for any kind of reasons. So we developed them in a way that the protection schemes overlay with the default one. Okay. So in case of we had any problems, we can just deactivate it mm -hmm. and the system just fall back to the default yeah. protection schemes yeah. Yeah. and it works fine that way. Okay. One other thing, um, the self pilot, these pilot projects in specific were designed in a way that if, if we want to insert a new remote switching station, it's not that easy because we have to reconfigure the algorithms, mm -hmm. reconfigure communication systems. We know right now it's a, it's a it's an expansion capacity problem, it's a scalability, pre scalability problem, but we, we are working on that. Okay, excellent. So maybe we can hand out uh, over to Renuka. Um, so thank you very much for the nice video. I was really wondering, um, of course, you, you put these, uh, uh, oh, I'm lacking the English word, Sprachakennung. Um, so that they can talk to the system and not fiddle around with the with the mouse and and, and the and the uh, uh, computer. But what I really wanted to, int uh, to to know is this decision support. Is that a list of pre-calculated options, or is it really has it really some intelligence in in being creative in in finding solutions and then proposing that to the to the operator? Yeah, so we are interested in applying machine learning concepts to see mm -hmm. if, uh, you know, as the system looks similar in different parts of the footprint, mm -hmm. that we can apply some machine learning techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, in the beginning, it will be pre-programmed decisions or scenarios that our operators or our engineers have experienced in prior that make up the beginnings of, uh, you know, voice assistance type support. Uh, but the goal is to apply some machine learning techniques Okay, and the system is already fully operational? No, it's or it not, so it's a vision. Um, oh, it's a we, vision, okay. So we, we still have to work through a lot of our systems talking mm. to each other. So for example, our EMS and market systems are from different vendors, they don't talk to each other. So we, are, we have some integration software that we own that's working okay. in between. So we are trying to slowly build that capability, um, but at the same time, you know, we are also transitioning our people from, you know, actually running the studies to being in charge of automation. So going from, you know, operators to automation managers. Yeah. So may I put, can put one more question. Um, so thank you for, for putting, for giving us the whole view and also highlighting again, what is the target? This is this reliability imperative, which you mentioned. So with this, part of the automation, uh, what, what is the share in the whole play? Is it prominent or is it one between many, many others? And what is the priorities about it? Um, so I would say the priority is high to at least automate the normal conditions. Mm -hmm. During the extreme conditions, we think we will need to have human intervention. Um, but the priority is pretty high. We are working on things like how do you assimilate these scenarios, are, then you know the machines can learn through the simulation events as well, not just the actual grid conditions. Okay, thank you. And finally, keeping Lucas in the in the loop here. Um, so, I was wondering, we we had this prolonged for for, for dozens of, of uh, years. We had this uh, level of substation automation and then uh, grid automation uh, for many many years. But now you're introducing something like an area, and um, what is the, the, the core purpose for doing so? Because that would require that you put another control level into the system with the real control center, with an operator sitting there, or what does it really mean? And how are these areas being defined? How do you cut the whole interconnected system into areas? Can you comment on that? Yeah, okay. So I don't have the, the, the answer because we have an ongoing R&D project, but the, the, the vision is that 
we want uh, high penetration of, uh, of automation in the system, obviously, and uh, for corrective action in real time. And we think that we can, uh, uh, it's kind of decomposition of the complexity of the whole problem. Mm -hmm. So uh, to foster those uh, autonomous uh, areas, mm -hmm. but they are not completely autonomous, they are linked uh, through the optimized layer, it's a kind of, uh, of uh, uh, decomposition of this problem and uh, it gives uh, more robustness on the system because uh, they are not connected to the others. Mm -hmm. uh, it gives resilience but, but to the, the system. system. Is, the system is connected. The area is not, but yeah, the system. Obviously, is. but uh, yeah. I was speaking about data and cyber uh, yeah. Yeah. physical mm -hmm. system. So mm -hmm. uh, the, the data is coming just from uh, the different subsession of the area, and uh, it's compute okay. in this area, mm -hmm. and the control are sent directly to the uh, flexibilities available in this area. So. When you have a, a huge problem, and we, we have one uh, recently in RT, okay, so some automation will still uh, manage the system mm -hmm. uh, for some corrective action, and you can have one automation that is down, but uh, there, is, there are not uh, 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 connection uh, between the different data of these different areas, so you, you can maintain your uh, system uh, uh, Okay. And, and does these areas need a whole system view? No. No. So they have so no, just they the are, data of their own they region. Are blind and focused on uh, the, mm -hmm. the data coming from, from, from the area. Okay. That's the, that's the, the, the vision. Okay. But we have to coordinate all this automotion. Mm -hmm. And this is done through the optimized layer because sometimes we have to pre configure the automation. We have to uh, uh, um, some, um, decide some preventive action also mm -hmm. to make this automation run in corrective in, in, uh, ways. And uh, so, so, so everything is connected, but weakly. So we think this is more robust for the whole system. And um, this functionality, which is being available in these areas is this fully automated is that the plan mm -hmm. or is there really an operator still in the loop uh, in this layer it's fully automated fully automated okay. yeah well, it's a vision we mm -hmm. have uh, uh, some experiment but uh, <laughs> have, uh, to continue to evangelize uh, internally in rt but uh, uh, so, so so we are uh, uh, pushing uh, yes to to have this uh, this uh, high control uh, high automation uh, from this this layer and this automation uh, purely automatic but in the optimized layer i mentioned that we will uh, still uh, uh, give uh, um, decision making function to, 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 to the operators to help him to, 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 to have a good decision to, to, to push some preventive action etc and in this optimized level we think the operator will still be in the loop okay. because we need some certification we need some guarantee mm -hmm. and uh, using machine, te uh, machine learning techniques we, we, we don't have basically this, this kind of, uh, okay. of validation and guarantee. So human in the loop in the uh, optimized uh, layer and fully uh, automated uh, design in the control layer. Okay, interesting. Okay, so I'd like, like to open the discussions to the audience, but we need young lady to transport the... Ah, here it is. Do you have some other microphones there? I can't see it yet. Okay, so please. I trust on you. Don't leave me alone here with putting questions. I think this is Patrick. Yes. Okay. Sorry. It's so, so bright here. I can't see you. Perhaps two questions. Perhaps one for Christian because you speak of this holonic <laughs> uh, uh, thing. So perhaps we can you can give some more information about that because I am fighting inside to to a very distributed. Uh, everything. So ICT, not only the function, because th they agree that we can decompose the problem, but they want to solve it at the national control center. So even they split in, in zone. So we we want to push the computation at the, and the area 
and also the ICT must be distributed. So if you, if you can comment on that, I think it could be interesting. And perhaps another question for all of you perhaps is the training. We need to train the operators with the assistant. So we need new labs new, to do that. And it's a big, big issue to, to, to develop these labs and the simulation engine that we need to train the people with this assistant. Yes, so, so, so if you can comment on that. Yeah, thanks Patrick for the question because we, we had recently a, a meeting in, in, in Split in Croatia and then we discussed as well what does it mean when we put functions automatically somewhere on an edge level, so close to the process, in a secondary substation and so on. Then we have a number of additional requirements because the function need to be automated, self-sustaining, but as well the data, what it means, so the local measurements and so on. But for example, if they are grid data, the grid data need to be always, yeah, available locally, but in line with some central models and so on. And as well, we need as well the communication in a specific way that there is as well a local communication that we are not depending, for example, from an overall communication system. Like nowadays, uh, mobile communication is a, is a highly centralized system because there's somewhere the server who is doing the connections and if the server has a failure, the communication will not work. So if we want to do it on the edge and if we want to do it locally, regionally, communication data and so on need to be yeah, self-sustainable so that we at the end can cut the system into different pieces into some islanding mode but not only for the power system operation as well for communication data and so on so that is a, a big challenge to to implement all of these ideas and then there are additional tasks like patch management and updates and this and that and how to handle it remotely because it will in the future when we have all these different autonomous local devices, it's not feasible that somebody is driving around and doing some patches here and there, but then as well to do it centralized with IT security and so on. And that's really the, for the question you, which you asked before, how long will it take until we have it? So pilot projects we have today, that's easy. But for a full-fledged rollout with all the security and so on, I think it can take a while because a lot of standardization and so on is necessary. Christian, could you also comment on the question, on the second part of the question? Will the operators lose their routine? Will they lose knowledge because if everything is automated? Like the let's same problem as we have with the aircraft pilots. Are they still in an emergency able to operate because this is something which we don't deem do in their daily life any longer if they're automated? I hope they are. We have a flight in two hours from now. I hope that for the flight, flight pilots, they are well trained for emergency. Uh, yeah, I, I think so. So they, they have to be trained and so on. It's, it's uh, yeah, sometimes some operators say, no, I want to have the measurement values on this and that. They need to know what the automation process is doing. For example, a couple of years when we, when I was working with wide area control things to say, okay, if there is a power flow controller and a parallel line, I don't need to give the set values and to measure what's going on. If there is an, a system which is always balancing the power flow between the lines and the operator knows how it behaves, then with this knowledge the operator can work. Huh? So the, the operators need to know what the automation processes are doing and for sure they need to get a warning when they are not working. Huh? But for sure it's, it's like with autonomous driving, huh? everything is running smoothly. And then the alert to the operator, to the driver, need to come early enough to say, okay, there is a problem, I cannot solve it, uh, please interact. A human cannot just jump in within a second, so a human usually needs at least a minute. Yeah, I was going to agree with the Professor Christian there. Um, yes, so I think much like pilots, we are trying to learn from the airline industry. Uh, human performance initiative training programs have become uh, the new trend in how to manage between when you intervene, uh, when automation fails. So things like effective communication, um, you know, automation management or uh, human response, and then 
also having routine habits, but also when anomalies happen, how do you break your chain of habit? Um, so we are trying to borrow heavily from the airline industry because at the end of the day, uh, even with all the automation, even though flights today can take off with a push of a button, nobody's getting on a plane without at least two pilots, <laughs> right? So I think the system will always have operators and trained operators that can intervene, uh, but we, I think we all have a lot to learn from the airline industry in that regard. Good. Any further comments here from the platform on that? Yes, please. Yeah, I, I, I agree with, with you all. Um, the training is a, is a must. Uh, although our operators can just manage the network, they have to know what, uh, what the automation does. And step forward if, they, if the automation failed or be deactivated. It's like a fallback plan. Today we, are, we do that and we are, will be trained to use the, the automation and be managers and supervisors. But we have to retain that knowledge. And we have to know how to keep operating the system if it fails. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, further questions? I don't know who was first. Please. Oh, okay, anyhow. Thank Please. you, Claudio Canizares, University of Waterloo, Canada. I had a question regarding the role of the operator in all of these systems that become very automatic. You, autom you make all the system automatic, so you start, you start basically the edge of the system, let's say a, a feeder is uh, controlling the, uh, uh, the, the dares and the vehicles by itself, right? And he's doing something, like what Christian was saying, and he's monitoring voltage, etc. Uh, the more you, you have these systems, the less likely the operator is to be able to do something or react to something because the systems are doing their own thing. It could be, it could, could be fighting with the central controllers, right? So how do, you, how do you coordinate this? How do you make sure that all these things are sort of one, somewhat working together because they are doing their own thing that might be actually affecting the system? So you can work on that. And the role of the operator in all of this, at what level? How many operators are you talking about? One central one? Lots of little operators everywhere. Thanks. So who wants to respond to that? Yeah, please. Okay. I think uh, the way to, at least uh, the way we are thinking about automation is to think about how autonomous cars are driving. When you press the brake, it goes off of cruise control. So it's having features in the software that will allow you to stop and take control so you can start driving. Um, but again, that, those are the software integrations and data controls that we have to achieve to achieve that level of we take control when we think, you know, our, we, in extreme weather conditions, we don't want it to be on autopilot. Uh, we want to take some control from the operator perspective. So that's at least how we are thinking about it, doing it through software where there are switches that says, no, we, you know, manual action will be taken here. Okay, good. So, Janos, please. Uh, thank you, Janusz Bialek, uh, Newcastle University, UK. Uh, so, well, first a reflection. I mean, I've been participating in all kinds of projects related to autonomous power systems. They used to go on the different name, homeostatic, self-healing, now autonomous, over 20 years or so. And we've produced many very good papers, but the take-up, actually pra practical take-up, has been a little bit disappointing. So, so this is my, my take on why it is. I mean, the examples which were given actually in this presentation related to, to something like reclosing automation, right? That means a device which is local and interacts very little with the rest of the system on the edge of the system, like, like, like Claudio just said. So the, the, but when, if we go higher up in, in the hierarchy, and that relates to the question distribution versus transmission, the higher you go up in, in the hierarchy, the more complicated it becomes. And, and, and you have to consider system effects. And then it's increasingly difficult to let it go because of the number of possibilities which are very difficult to pre-compute and prepare the system to do it. Uh, so, and that, I think, if you look at the top system level, system operator, the system operator sees themselves as God. They can see everything and they can do everything. And I think uh, they will find it very difficult to let it go completely. It means just sit back and, and, and see what's happening and let, let the, the computer systems to do everything themselves. 
And this is psychological reason. As I said, they see themselves as the God. But also there's a practical reason, because that's like where with Tesla car, it can go on its own, but still requires the driver to hold the, 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 the hands on the, heel, on, on the wheel. If something happens, they have to take action. And, and the, the problem with automation is that you cannot cover all the possibilities of what would happen. You always have to require to, to, to at the end of the day, have probably a human being, because human being brain works um, over the wider scale of possibilities and can take actions when some, some emergency, which were not been taken into account in preparing the system, uh, take place. So, I'll close the view of the panel. So, I think this was more a statement, and I think we all agree about that. Or any objections, please? Yeah, um, yeah, I think you're right. Um, so um, indeed, the operator sees itself as God, as God. and um, um, in contrast to um, like driving a car, like we don't want the hassle of driving the car. It doesn't, you know, it's stressful. We don't want it. But the operator, he he, he really uh, doesn't like to give his power away because he's at the end of the day he's responsible for the power system and. Um, the only thing that is, is going to change his view is if he, if he is not able to control the power system anymore um, on itself. So there, is, there, need, there, there needs to be an uh, incentive, an external incentive for him to realize, okay, I cannot manage this. I need some kind of support in order to, because the system is getting too complex. And we are getting there slowly right now. And this is um, why the, um, the, the autonomous functionalities are starting to, to gain attraction there. It's not only a, a matter of, of research anymore, it's the people, the operators itself are going to ask uh, to the manufacturer saying, okay, we need this functionality right now. Um, of course, this will need some a few years of, um, of uh, research and development and um, there are only certain tasks really that, uh, that are right now auto automated um, but the trend is certainly there because um, the systems are getting too complex and um, yeah, the god, the operator god cannot handle anything, any, uh, not everything anymore and he, he's overwhelmed and this is the state uh, which we uh, together need to, need to heal. So the research has been working on, um, on solutions for ages, um, the operators didn't want to hear anything about that and now we need to get everybody together and develop a solution where the operator is also in the boat and integrated into the process and we need to talk to them and they re really want, need to want this solution. It's not a matter of, okay, we could do this, um, but if it's not necessary, we won't, nobody will buy the, the functionalities because it's unwanted. We really need to focus on uh, what the operator will need. Yeah, I, I think the comment is absolutely right. The, 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 the operator on the higher system levels, for sure, they, they will be there, they need to interact. But the question is, theoretically, from a big control center, then you could control, the, let's say, the voltage set point for a converter at the PV plant on low voltage level. Nobody would do it. So, and there is somehow this, this split in the system that really medium voltage and so on should work. Uh, automatically and it's, it's similar like in a car when you brake you just brake and you're not braking individually at all, all four brakes in the car so the car is splitting it up and controlling that you stable come to stop but you are the controller in the control center of your car and you brake and, and that's the point so everything below should to a certain extent be automated but and that is maybe related to Claudio's question before the this, this system behavior may be really uh, influenced by that drastically because when you nowadays you we assume from a certain system level everything what is below you have a certain active power and with a some cosinus phi you have some reactive power and so on even this behavior is now changing with some all the power electronics and so on or if on a certain voltage level you have a perfect balance of reactive power then you have a complete different system behavior in terms of voltage stability for example and that need to be considered as well to say the models of what is going on below with automation that need to be properly built in the control center that they know what's going on and how the system behavior will be 
when all the tiny little controllers and operational schemes are doing something, huh? because if you're not aware what they are doing, then you cannot control the overall system. And that really, I think, need to be worked out. And that is the question we had here on this conference as well. What is the proper model of a future distribution grid seen from high voltage level, for example, and so on? If I may add, if I may add just one uh, point. Um, Certainly, it's a culture shift. Operators don't trust new tools easily, so uh, we are seeing that where I think they take time to trust new information or uh, machine learning products. But at the same time, as we look at the future resource portfolio where all the big generators have probably retired and you have a lot of distributed energy resources with, uh, which are small, uh, the operator won't have that intuition. So in, in many ways, I think automation is the only way. It's your guide to what decisions you can make because you know everything is uh, small that adds up to big uncertainty and volatility. May I add one, one point to that? Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether operators really feel like gods because uh, I've seen many of them sweating in emergency situations. <laughs> I don't know whether God is sweating, uh, but... Um, uh, Seriously, um, the last thing an operator want to have is a support system which gives erroneous or untrustworthy results. So I think that is a, a very important thing. How, how do you handle that? Yeah, so we have what we call parallel operations. So anytime we bring a new tool on, we let the trial go on for six months or nine months, and we let the operators do it in parallel with the new tool so they can start to trust the tool. Um, I'll give you an example. We created a new sufficiency tool um, that tells them, you know, in various parts of the footprint what our sufficiency is. It took us almost 18 months to roll that out because operators actually pointed out where the automation was wrong. Um, yeah, so we but, had to improve but, it. That's the typical approach, but yeah. the operators need these tools in particular during emergencies. Yeah. And will you have an emergency during this test period? Hopefully not. <laughs> so yeah. that is the point. That's why, right? So, so that's why I think also simulator is an important aspect. How do you simulate and backcast events? And, you know, operators work on shift. For example, an operator could work for five years and never see a hurricane. We have that situation at uh, our company. So that's why we are trying to see how we can backcast events um, so we can simulate some actions as well. So again, a lot more to learn from technology and how we simulate, uh, create machine learning. I mean, I think we all have um, a lot to learn as the industry changes um, and be ready for it. Okay, thank you. So, please, engine. Yeah, is that engine? Yeah, engine. Thanks. I, I, I have two questions. Uh, uh, both of them has to do with challenges to automation. Uh, one is that uh, I, I think um, Christian started the, the conversation by saying that, well, here are some things that uh, people do, and so it'd be nice to have the computers do it instead. So I, I thought another way of looking at it is that what are those parts of uh, the grid that are already automated? And, uh, you know, so what comes to mind is protection, what comes to mind is voltage control. What comes to mind is frequency control or, or balancing. All right. So those are those are things that are not done by by human beings. The, the so the first question that comes up is with all the changes that are happening on the system, can we still depend on the automation of these functions? All right. So I'm I'm already hearing from my distribution protection people that, you know, with these two-way flows, it's getting to be quite complicated. Uh, I'm hearing that uh, these uh, wind farms are creating new problems with protection. But the problem, I think, is uh, that is uh, even more uh, pressing is the, is the balancing. Because I think we are still, even with a lot of wind and solar, we are still very dependent on the inertial part of the system to keep our frequency very close to uh, nominal. And what, what needs to change for this thing? So, so, but the basic question I'm asking is, you know, let's make sure that all the automation we already do continues to help. 
the other question is um, looking at the control center operator. You know, my, the time I have spent in control centers, uh, you know, op if everything is normal, the operators are not doing anything. And so the, the question is, the operators have to do things when things are going wrong. And, and this is where we need more automation, even if it is just advice, right? So the question to you is, what are the first things you would like to, uh, what are the first challenges that you, we have a chance of uh, applications that we can provide in the control center? Anybody, Lucas, maybe? Yeah. Trying to give an answer. <laughs> so, uh, I think I think we we need automation because the, the 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 complexity is increasing. But we need also proxies of this automation to be to take into account in the in the in the control room those uh, automatic control. So we need proxies for this. And then to to reduce the complexity to 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 for the operator. Uh, we need new methods to screen and to filter uh, uh, the, the, the good situation and to focus the operator on the only risky situation. So uh, it's a hierarchical uh, 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 implication from, uh, uh, so you, you have proxy from the, 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 the lower layer and uh, uh, in the control layer you, 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 you you have some automation, you need some proxies for the upper layer, and then you, you, you can run some new simulation uh, 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 based on machine learning to, to screen, to filter, to, uh, for example, to speed up the computational time, because you can have proxies with machine learning of the detailed uh, simulators. So this is, this is very good. So we have, so what I want is, yes, to, first convince our uh, operators uh, internally, and uh, uh, we want also uh, to foster uh, uh, um, the development of new methodology using uh, uh, robust optimization in, uh, in our case, uh, using uh, machine learning, and, uh, and to develop some uh, more uh, automation uh, related to uh, congestion issues uh, that we have in the, in the grid. Thank you, Lucas. Um, Andrew, I, I would like to, or, or I tend to disagree with one of your statements, because if you look a little bit into the future, we will have the situation that we have most, a um, big share of the generation down in the distribution systems. So, we cannot, I believe we cannot handle that from a TSO perspective by taking the phone number and calling this control room guys in the, in, the, in the distribution to say, please, can you reduce your input or can you do this and that and that? So that needs to be automated and that brings me to the next question or the next topic. What about this interface between TSOs and DSOs? How will that develop and what automation functions do we need? to run the system on millions of small generators. So, look here on my platform. Rui? I can comment on that. Well, um, today most of our um, communications with the TSOs are basically about uh, load sheddings when, uh, when they are needed. Not so much about uh, curtailment or reactive power management. Uh, perhaps, but perhaps that will be the future. That's perhaps some of the more interactions in the communications that we need. We need to balance not only that, but uh, the full optimization of the, the system. And um, we are developing, there are protocols like the ICCP that perhaps can be expanded to other functions. Not just that, but um, to further develop the, real, the relationship so, they, so that we can um, can optimize all the electric grid. I, I can report, and uh, maybe Christian or uh, Stefan knows more about that, that there's a project uh, about to finalize uh, in Germany now about called Redispatch 2.0, where we're doing congestion management with generation 
sit located in the distribution systems of course that need to be automated but you can't do that manually in the old style i call the operator down there and then say, please you know could you uh, schedule uh, reschedule your wind uh, park in in sitting in the 110 kb system okay we have only five minutes left so therefore um i would like to ask the question also might be interesting to the pcc community do we have all the technology available if you want to go further down this road so uh, it's more automation and tso dso automation etc cetera, etc cetera, or do we need anything which is really not available this has to be a groundbreaking new technology or whatever how do you see that do we just need to put together all these things which are available or do we have something really brand new really good. could you or do you wish to comment on that sure I do think the, from a technology perspective, um, you know, the, the algorithms or the, uh, you know, the specific technology or computation speed is there, but I do think cross-functional knowledge expertise is not there. So as what I've learned in my automation journey is it's taking a lot of time for the software engineer to talk to the power systems expert to design the necessary automation. So which is where I think more multidisciplinary uh, practices or you know, education will help. Um, I think that's where I see some challenges, uh, but so far I've not run into a situation. I mean, every once in a while, given the big systems and big TSOs will want more computational speed, but they find a way. You know, the mathematicians have been great that way. They've been giving us new algorithms to use. But what I've found is it, it's the cross-functional knowledge transfer that's taking time to understand uh, the different concepts. Lucas, do you want to comment on that? Maybe also on the TSO-DSO interface? Oh, yes, on the TSO-DSO interface. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> I think we can have a conference can about comment, it. Uh, all the day because uh, yes we, we we are trying to to communicate uh, and to to exchange and to to jump uh, in Europe European project with uh, with uh, our colleagues uh, from Enedis and it's really complicated to to define what we want exactly at the interface so uh, because we want to use uh, both the, the 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 flexibilities that are in the distribution grid so. <laughs> If I have a dream, is uh, can we define some some interface uh, to both uh, uh, communicate directly uh, to, to to the flexibility in the distribution grid, because uh, this offer uh, also uh, much more robustness. Okay, we have uh, uh, to 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 send a control to to the flexibility and how to define that we will not uh, disturb uh, the distribution network when sending our control to the flexibility. So the thing is how to manage this through perhaps the buzzword digital twin you know, and to calculate some uh, 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 tunnel of confidence uh, where you can send your, your control uh, without perturbating the, 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 the grid of the of entities of RT. So this is a, a really a challenge, uh, uh, this uh, in France. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to hand over the question to Rui. So would you be happy if your TSO would start to control directly any devices in your grids or it, it maybe even at the customer without, without that you're well, getting aware can, of that? They can send us the commands they need and we rely them. Okay. And <laughs> yeah. we can have, sure, some interactions, <laughs> but uh, perhaps uh, they don't have to. Okay. It can just send the set points they need for okay. the the balance areas that they mm. are requiring, mm. and then we can rely on our resources and our DURs and make the changes accordingly. And perhaps okay. there's no need or a scenario where it don't always be needed mm -hmm. for them to to manage them directly. I think it's, it's not a good idea because then you need to have this object on your control room and this is not doable yeah, with, with uh, objects we may have in the low voltage grid. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. So we have two minutes. Final question. Anything urgent? Yes, please. Patrick, you're the last speaker, but you need to have a microphone. No, you need to have a microphone. Otherwise, you can't hear you. 
Yeah, just some extension perhaps of that. If the complexity increased so much, do we need to go to some back-to-back -back connection to, to, to reduce the complexity <laughs> and to manage the interface on some small area? Or is it something that we can, yeah. Could, could you comment on that, Christian? Or? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Because I, th I think that this complexity increase too much that it w yeah. we need to have a technical yes, interface to, to control yeah. the system. It would be oh, not based on market or whatever. Or market just at the interface, but not market at the very tiny. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would agree with that. Think. And I, I still believe that some hierarchies and uh, not talking, everybody talking to everybody, but keeping the hierarchies we have today that is really a good approach and maybe we can develop that a bit further there are a couple of things around like a web of cells or cellular systems and, and such things that we are really understanding that these are active and that they can offer flexibilities but then we also need to to develop the markets into this direction that they have a financial extent a financial benefit on, on, on doing that. So well, that's important. Okay, so um, we are right exactly at the end of our schedule. So I want to thank you all for the lively discussion we had, also the audience, of course. And I'm quite sure we have enough work ahead for further PSCCs. And that brings us exactly to the closing session, because there I can promise you the next venue of the PSCC will be announced. Thank you very much all and uh, stay healthy. And see you again in 24 at the latest at the next PSCC. Thank you. Well, if you uh... Hang on just for a few more minutes. Uh, we will close uh, this uh, PSCC conference. Uh, but before that, we have a very important announcement to make. So um, uh, if Soren is in the audience, uh, please come up here. So let me let me introduce Soren Olaru uh, from Paris Saclay, and uh, he's going to be the host of the next PSCC. So you want that? You want to talk about that? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to to thank uh, Joao and uh, all his team for for for. The organization and uh, for this memorable week uh, in Porto. Uh, but uh, yes, the, the PSCC series has to go on and um, the PSCC Council um, uh, endorsed our uh, application for organizing the next, uh, the next PSCC and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, I'm coming from, uh, from France, from Paris Saclay, uh, I'm a professor in um, a school of engineering called uh, yeah, um, Central Spelec, and uh, we will be happy to to see you in uh, in France in two years' time. Now I don't know how to switch the. Uh, maybe somebody can help me. Ah, okay, so. Um, yeah, Paris Saclay, there is Paris in the name, but uh, you will not be seeing uh, Eiffel Tower uh, from the rooms of the conferences because we are located somewhere at 20 kilometers uh, south. Uh, but the campus is new, is growing, and is uh, having nice facilities. Uh, and we'll try to make you test uh, some uh, French flavor and, and culture. So I prepare you, uh, okay, so, images.
Yeah, so maybe the most important uh, information were, uh, were the dates. So you just saw it's 3 to 7 of uh, June 2024. And uh, just, just, I mean, after the conference, you can stay there for the Olympic Games uh, if you are interested. That's all from my side. Uh, thank thank you, you again to the Council for, 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 for the support and uh, hope there will be no pandemics and uh, we'll see there in presence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Olaru. Um, and uh, we are going to look forward to uh, seeing all of you uh, two years from now. And so the final, final thing that we have to do is to close down the conference. And for that, I ask uh, Professor Goran Anderson, who is the president of the con conference 2022, to declare his closing. Okay, thank you very much. I'm glad to see that so many people are here at the very last uh, session. I won't be long. Um, I, uh, when I was asked to be president of the conference, I asked what are my duties? And, uh, and they are not very heavy, so that was one reason why I accepted it immediately. It was to give a short speech at the uh, opening, which I did on, on, on Tuesday, and uh, then a short speech at the banquet, I've done that, and then make a short speech at the closing session. So I'm soon finished with my duties of this conference. Uh, but it, it's a good time to reflect a little on a conference uh, like this. And I, I would like to remind you that Power System Conf uh, Computation Conference, PECC, is its own organization. Formally, it's a non-profit organization that is registered in, in Switzerland. And we are not backed up by any organization like IEEE or IET or SIGRE or anything. And uh, that has to do how it was uh, founded uh, once, about 60 years ago, when there was a group of power system engineers in Europe from uh, the industry, from research institutes and from academia that uh, had a feeling that this new device called computer could be used in power system anal analysis and, and, and control. And they got together and uh, the result we see here today, that's uh, PECC. So um, you could make an analogy and say that I heard once a cosmologist that explained the creation of universe as in the beginning there was nothing which exploded. And um, that, that is what we see here today is the result of that explosion that we have these 224 papers being presented and many more were, were submitted. And. Um, uh, I want to say one thing that those of you that are in interested in the history of PECC, please go to a web page called PECC-Central.eu, I think it is, you can Google it, and there you will find copies of all papers uh, published from 1972 when the conference was held in Grenoble up uh, to uh, today. And the first three conferences held in 63, 66 and 69, the papers from those conferences will soon be online. I, I think it's very good to have a sense of the history when also when you look in, into the future. And uh, I, I browsed through some of these early papers and there are a few things that uh, strike you. One thing is that they were typed on paper and quite often the formulas were written in by hand at that time. I mean, word processing didn't ex exist at that time. So people had to work harder to actually write the paper. I mean, the typographical uh, outline of the papers today are like books, which were not the case at, at uh, that time. So. Uh, I advise you to go back and have a, a, a look on, on these papers. Another thing that struck me is that those early papers, they didn't have any abbreviations in them. 
And I think that is something that has happened in our industry during the last year. It's the proliferation of abbreviations. I went to one presentation here, I won't say which one, and I counted on the final slide that of all the nouns, 50% were abbreviations, and half of them I didn't understand. So uh, a plea to you, please try to avoid abbreviations, because I think abbreviation is, is a way to, to build silence, that people outside your area do not understand what uh, A, B, D, P is, for instance. <laughs> so um, uh, with those words, I uh, hope that you have had a good conference. I have enjoyed it very much. I've learned a lot and I hope you have learned too. And perhaps you have made new contacts, come up with new ideas, met uh, new co colleagues where you can start new corporations. And that's the meaning of a conference like this. And um, then we know next time we will see each other. Most of us, I hope, will be in Paris in, in two years time approximately. And uh, my final word will be by a scientist uh, whose results are the basis of this conference. It's said that the famous uh, scientist Michael Faraday had a little sign above his desk with three words. And the words were work, finish, publish. And uh, with these words, <laughs> I would like to close this conference and thank you all and hope to see you again in Paris in two years time. Thank you.